Okay, so good morning. Um, welcome to today's lecture, which is fifth lecture on protein ligand protein protein interactions. So, in last lectures, actually, we have uh, looked at how we can uh, use protein detected experiments uh, to understand the interaction between protein protein and protein ligand. In this case, if we are detecting protein, most uh, most commonly used are like a labeled protein. Uh, you can isotopically label the protein using N15 or N15C13 and then uh, you can one can titrate with another protein or another molecule can be ligand and then look at the perturbation that is happening in each peak. So, that perturbation essentially reports whether interaction is happening, if interaction is happening, where actually it is happening. So, not only the strength of interaction can be probed kinetics can be probed and also the location. So, you can map those interacting residue on the structure and you can find it out where actually in the uh, on the structure the ligand is interacting. Now, depending upon the rates with which uh, the interactions happen, they are classified into slow, fast and intermediate and I explained this with respect to NMR time scale what is called slow, what is called fast and what is intermediate and we can detect the binding site on protein as I mentioned. So, if something is, is slow that means you can simultaneously two, two, see two peaks. So, one is for free protein, another is for protein plus ligand and simultaneously seeing two peaks says that this is happening at slow time scale. Fast means one average peak you see and intermediates generally you broad peak you see. So, these are typical um, thumbs up rule of knowing whether the exchange is happening at slowest time scale, fast time scale or intermediate time scale. And using all these information actually you can map on the on the protein side. So, here is my protein suppose and here are some residue that are showing exchange or interaction you can map those actually you can find it out where the interaction is happening. So, this is this binding site you can write it binding site on protein. Now, even you can use this information to create a dot model or a complex model of protein ligand. Okay. So, that is what we can learn uh, we, we learned in the last lecture. Today, I am going to go a little more advanced and discuss two of the uh, techniques that basically proves the exchange that is happening at a microsecond time scale um, where k d is in, in micromolar range this we call it say typically intermediate time scale. So, what happens suppose um, you have studied the folding landscape. Now, suppose the protein is binding and, and, and populating another state which is not quite uh, pronounced. So, like say protein is binding and remaining uh, protein is binding and only populating 5 percent or 2 percent or 10 percent of these states and these are in constant exchange. So, now can we detect this 5 or 10 percent of bound state? So, actually say these are lowly populated say probably excited state, lowly populated means like their quantity is less 2 percent, 5 percent and excited state because they are somehow change their conformation from one conformation to another conformation and they are populated in low, so low concentration. So, can we detect these states right. So, can we detect these states using NMR experiments? Yes, we can and that is what done using called CPMG experiments or relaxation dispersion experiment. So, we will be discussing today what actually is relaxation dispersion experiment briefly not uh, very much detail because this requires quite elaborate explanation, but quite qualitatively I can tell you that how these experiments can be used to probe this lowly populated excited state uh, which populates only smaller fraction like 2 to 5 percent or even maximum up to 10 percent. So, how we can detect this? Now, now the, the question is that here we have a ground state or say energy minimized state. So, here is my landscape funnel and here are various states that populates. So, one of these is say one of the state and it is exchanging with another state 
which is also near native, but this is ligand bound state. And this happening in only two state fashion. So, CPMG mostly uh, deals with a two state exchange uh, and two state exchange bound and free states. So, now not only it detects the K exchange rate, it also ex, uh, finds it out population of PA and PB. PA is a state which is say here the uh, unligated state, PB can be ligated as just or excited state. So, uh, the rate, the like uh, kinetics, the thermodynamics and also population it detects it. So, how it detects? Let us look at um, little bit more in detail. So, this is called CPMG experiment, car, parcel, mobium, gill experiment, uh, relaxation dis person experiment and basically this is used to characterize and quantify the binding process in the intermediate to slow exchange regime, intermediate to slow exchange regime using relaxation dispersion experiment. So, this is nothing but a T2 experiment, uh, we have uh, run uh, like learned the T2 experiment uh, or R2. So, R2 is transverse uh, relaxation. So, R2 has two component R2 intrinsic plus Rex. This Rex is telling about the exchange process that is happening and R2 is R2 intrinsic. So, when we measure R2, we essentially get both of these things, intrinsic uh, transverse relaxation rate and the exchange rate given by Rex. So, this Rex has this, this phenomena uh, of exchange can be used those experiments like a CPMG experiment to find it out what is the exchange rate happening. So, this very effectively probe the K exchange rate and as low as like 0.5 percent of minor populated state, often these states minor populated state is called excited state or many people call it dark state, invisible because you can imagine the 99 percent, 98 percent is populated by, by the ground state like um, that is what we hear and some states which is very low populated 0 0.5, 1 percent, 2 percent. So, that is a dark state because the signal will be dominated by this ground state 98 percent fraction, but still NMR gives enables you to detect this 2 percent or 1 percent states which is excited state, but it is invisible state. So, how we can do that um, by doing Rex experiment? So, quickly I will just try to explain you what essentially we do. So, here is my state A which in energy landscape here and here is my state B and they are in exchange right. So, this is say 95 percent, 98 percent, this 5 percent ok. Now, you have to do record the CPMG experiment at various uh, like where you vary the distance between the pi pulses that I show you, you in the previous slide. So, here pi pulses if you see is 2 which gives you the R2 effective here and if you increase this you get R2 effective here and intensity decays basically this intensity decay as you vary the frequency of CPMG pulses you can fit this and find it out the exchange rate, the fraction of like a population of A state, population of B state. So, for each residue using this HSQC based experiment, you can do this relaxation dispersion experiment, fit the intensity and you can find it out not only the population like a what is the fraction, the exchange rate, but also the probable structure of the alternative state. What I mean by say here is my major state and here is my minor state which is like say 2 percent only, this is 98 percent. So, mostly what we do? We get signal from here, but when we do this kind of CPMG experiment, you can also get some information from this 2 state, uh, the 2 percent one and using this curve we, we can fit it out and find it out what is this other state, invisible state chemical shift. So, if you can figure it out the chemical shift of invisible state using that information essentially you can find the structure even the structure of the invisible states. So, that is what relaxation dispersion experiment enables you to finding it out Kex exchange rate between these two 
the population P A and P B of these two states and also the structure of the invisible state. So, what essentially we are doing is in this constant time we are changing the pi pulse frequency and because of this the intensity decay happens and intensity decay of R2 effective can be fitted it out to find it out all these parameters, the exchange rate, the populations and also the chemical shift of the invisible states which essentially tells you about the structure of the invisible state. So, how this, this actually happens? So, simply like a, a very beautiful uh, work done by Louis K and uh, his former colleague called Antonio Mittermeier, um, he is still uh, working on these areas. So, essentially they explained it very, very like uh, nicely in a in, in relatively easy manner giving an example of a runner and a walker. So, suppose uh, a bunch of people uh, are running a cross country race. Okay? Now there are a bunch of people who run fast and some people run slow. So say they are running 5 kilometers, so like they start at t equal to 0 and certain time t equal to 1 hour, they reach somewhere and you see there is a large distribution, uh, dis large distribution of distance between them what they cover. Who run faster, they can quite easily uh, reach to the goal and those who are really slower they will reach somewhere 2 kilometer, 3 kilometers. So, you have a large dispersion. So, here is what we are saying. So, here we started and they are running. So, they reach somewhere depending upon on the distance. So, here you have a large dispersion. Okay. So, here is our R2 effective large dispersion. Now, you, you are say a referee and what you are doing? So, they run half an hour and you ask them or you blow a whistle and ask them to return back. Uh, so, when they return back the, you see that dispersion between them, dispersion means like distance that they cover between them it will be slower like a it will be narrow. And if you blow a whistle many times the difference between the distance that covered will be minimum. So, that is what we have at the bottom. The dispersion is very minimal and when we have only one pi pulse or two pi pulse dispersion between them is very high. So, because of this dispersion measurement sorry dispersion measurement that we are doing the two pi pulse and many pi pulse you see the R2 effective here is high and R2 effective here is low and essentially you fit this curve to find it out all those parameter that we are discussing. So, this is the uh, min minimalistic experiment uh, explanation that I, I can give you how this relaxation dispersion experiment does. It is a really, really powerful experiment and it is very much used in understanding the enzyme kinetics, understanding the protein, protein, protein ligand interaction where the other state is populated really low, right, as low as 5 percent or 0.5 percent. So, that is all about relaxation dispersion. Let us move to another important uh, experiment called ZZ exchange. So, ZZ exchange essentially probes the slower process where the k exchange rate ranges from 0.1 to 10 of seconds. Suppose two states are really exchanging slow. Okay. So, say suppose protein one protein is going from monomer to dimer. So, it is a self association protein protein interaction self association happening. This is a monomer and this is dimer. Okay. And this exchange between them is happening really slow order of say 0.1 second to 10 second. This is slower at the NMR time scale. Now, what happens? You, you record uh, this ZZ exchange, uh, ZZ exchange experiment and what you do? You put them in, in Z magnetization and let them mix, right? whatever we do in an OG experiment, let the magnetization be mixed. So, to start with we are seeing a monomer peak and a dimer peak and if the exchange is happening between them as you increase this time 400 to 800 second you see you start seeing this cross peaks. Now, this cross peaks is telling that they are self associating there is exchange between monomer and dimer and you can find it out the rates at which it is happening. So, here essentially if you look at we are increasing the time mixing time and because of this uh, when they are mixing more you are getting a cross peaks. 
So, that is measuring the self association or protein ligand, it, it can be used for protein ligand interaction, even the catalysis that is happening at slow, similar concepts can be used to probe um, the, uh, the cross like probe to the phenomena that is happening at the slow exchange, ZZ exchange actually offers this. So, probably I covered you all the range the fast exchange, intermediate exchange and slow exchange how it happens and what it happens. So, if we understood this can we move ahead and just try to understand can we like a essentially uh, can we get it more quantitative manner. So, in, in the jet exchange as I discussed it is a longitudinal magnetization created allowed to transfer from one state to another state or a major bound state to unbound states and the, the here are the cross peaks that are appearing. So, population of k exchange between two can be determined by the intensity of these cross peaks or volume of the cross peaks with a different mixing time. So, intensity may change like this and you can find it out the k exchange that is what about j exchange. Now, once we have the idea about the slow exchange, the intermediate exchange, the fast exchange can we get slightly more quantitative try to fix this parameter and and do it uh, and get some some parameters that one can do it so how we can fit this nmr observe observe uh, binding events so for getting a quantitative state estimate we need to know something like a, we need to know what is the concentration of protein uh, starting concentration of protein which is p0 in what range this KD should come. So, you should have some idea from any orthogonal techniques like we discussed ITC, SPR or any other technique fluorescence based. So, what is typically order of the magnitude we are getting that will be good idea to have this. So, you should have a um, idea of the uh, some KD and the concentration of proteins should be of that order right. So, of the order of KD. The total ligand concentration say L0 should be 1 tenth or 10 times of KD depending upon what is there and uh, 1 times of KD. So, if we do and we are doing a titration and probing this chemical shift suppose change. So, it, it slowly goes and after that certain time it's, it saturates. What is saturation? The perturbation in the chemical shift as you increase the ligand concentration the CSP changes and saturates. So, you can if you know all these parameter what is the P0 the initial concentration of protein, the initial concentration of ligand and the KD, uh, KD that probably suppose we want to determine what we are seeing delta observed. So, how much actually we are seeing we can fit essentially these equations and uh, we can find it out KD right or if we know typically KD we can even predict how my observed chemical shift is going to change come. So, essentially here delta observed is the what, what is the chemical shift that we are observing at a particular ligand protein concentration. This is the maximum that we are observing here right. So, we can if we are assuming simple 2 x state ha happening 2 state exchange happening between free form to protein ligand form essentially we can feed all these parameters and find it out the KD uh, of the uh, binding event. Okay, so, let us see how we can do that I will give you some of the example. So, here like a binding event happening two exchange single site binding happening between the protein and ligand right. So, typically suppose we take a protein concentration of 100 micromolar that is what I said KD um, if the KD is in micromolar range you can have the protein concentration up to um, in the same range. So, 100 micromolar. Now, the maximum shift on saturation delta max can be say 1 ppm uh, for a highly concentrated ligand and KD 0.1 millimolar of protein concentration same as the uh, KD. So, protein concentration is same as the KD. So, depending upon how we ligand concentration we vary you can see a different saturation curve. So, here it is going and KD is typically of 1. Now, if we are saturated quite easily, so ligand is saturated with uh, ligand is saturating the protein, KD is 
uh, 0.001 and in different case uh, one can simulate what is the KD with typical these parameters. Okay. So, that is single binding site the KD uh, calculation with the shift change. Let me uh, repeat again. So, typically you are taking 100 micromolar of protein and we are titrating with the ligand. So, here you can see we have taken millimolar of, of ligand 0.1 millimolar 0.2 and our protein concentration number is how much 100 micromolar right. So, that is what we are starting with so, 0.1 millimolar right uh, yeah 10 to power yes. Uh, okay. So, 1000 micromolar is 1 millimolar. So, 0 0.1 millimolar of protein we are starting. So, when we put 1 uh, 0.1 millimolar, if KD is 1, we are getting a straight line here. Okay. It is increasing like this, it will saturate somewhere going here. Now, if our KD uh, is, is slightly higher 0.1, we are getting saturation almost now reaching here and if KD is very strong like a very minimal in micromolar, so here 10 to the power minus 3 micromolar, uh, so in millimolar case you will see that it is saturating very fast. So, depending upon the strength of the binding, ligand protein in uh, concentration which choose we can find a different kind of course that can be interpreted to find it out KD. Now, another thing one can say here say ligand was fixed at 0.5 millimolar and protein concentration is, is being changed. So, depending upon what KD we have uh, for different protein concentration you see a different kind of curve that is that is coming. Right. So, that is what essentially you can find it out with the chemical shift change. So, let us look at some of the example. So, here what I am showing you uh, interaction between two protein one is called PDI protein di disulfide isomerase which is interacting with an intrinsically disordered protein called alpha synuclein this protein is involved in neurodegeneration. So, we are titrating this alpha synuclein with, with the uh, PDI. So, first thing what we did we N15 labeled this protein and PDI was unlabeled okay, with no isotopic label. We recorded HSQC spectrum of this protein and then we are titrating with PDI. So, here uh, we can see the nicely dispersed uh, spectrum of the alpha synuclein. You can see the uh, like a, although it is a narrow range, but the peaks are very sharp and, and very round shape. And now if you have such uh, good resolution, you can monitor even peak wise what is happening. So, once you start titrating your protein here, the other protein is 1, 1 to 0 0.1, in the first case 1 alpha synuclein 0 0.1 PDI. You see some of the peaks already started shifting, I, I have blown up picture here. Then when we increase to 0.25, some more peaks here you can see start appearing, uh, sorry start shifting. At even more 0.5 you can see lots of peaks now seems to be showing the chemical shift perturbation and one equivalent you can find lot more are showing the chemical shift perturbation. So, here in the zoom picture you can see the shift is happening here. Uh, and M5 again you see S9 you see L38. So, many of such peaks are showing shift. Now, that is fantastic. Now, you once you titrate you know how the protein ligand concentration is changing here L concentration you have and here delta delta you have a change in the chemical shift. So, this is the thing that if you know the chemical shift change you can probably fit it and find it out how they are binding. So, that is that is what one can do. The another thing if you notice what is happening here few of the peaks are showing decrease in the intensity. If you look at closure two things are happening one shift in the uh, resonance frequency or chemical shift perturbation. The second thing happening is some of the peaks are showing decrease in the intensity. So, that also can be plotted and what we found that here essentially some of the peaks that were showing a decrease in intensity 
are coming from the N terminus of the protein and some were from the C terminus of the protein. So, these from the N terminus upon PDI titration of alpha synuclein uh, can be measured basically of a mutant and the wild type you can see there is some variations when uh, you take a like a mutant essentially in the wild type you see lot more peaks are coming. So, even changing one residue lots of variations you can see it. So, these two NMR observable can be used for fitting and getting the KD. So, now the chemical shift perturbation we can fix it here is the PDI concentration, here is the uh, protein concentration, here is the ligand concentration and this is the shift in the chemical shift. So, 3D plot we have made. The peaks are shifting here and this shift essentially you can plot it, plot to find it out KD. So, um, one can find it out the KD of these uh, residue specific KD of alpha synuclein which is found to be in micromolar range. So, for some it was 8 micromolar, some for some it was 1, 26 and 48. So, what we can infer here? Now, KD you can find it out using the classical thermodynamic technique like ITC or SPR. SPR essentially gives you K on and K off rate which can be used to calculate the KD. ITC gives you delta G, delta H, T delta S and a stoichiometry you can even get the thermodynamic parameter. But what NMR is offering you? Not only the value the KD but also offering the residue specific KD which side of the protein is contributing more towards the binding which was not possible in ITC or SPR in single experiment. Yes, you can mutate the protein, create a different mutant and look at the relative importance of the one site uh, C terminus, N terminus or middle site. But in a single experiment now NMR is offering you to find it out residue specific KD of these bindings. Another example I am giving you where intermediate range uh, regime binding was there. So, this is the example coming from a sumo it is E 2 interaction sumo is ubiquitin small ubiquitin related modifier it does the protein modification while binding to various enzymes. So, one of the enzyme is called ubc 9 that it binds and it forms a complexes. So, when we did like titration what we see that upon increasing the concentration 1 to 0 0.5, 1 to 0 0.1, 1 to 0 0.3. Lots of peaks are changing. They are showing decrease in the intensity. Okay. Um, prominently in this region, in this region and this region, but other regions were also participating. Now, here the chemical shift perturbation is not happening. So, I cannot fit that data to find it out what is the KD. So, but we use again orthogonal techniques and we find it out the KD is coming to be 4 micromolar. So, you saw that here essentially in the previous slide we found that 8 micromolar there was reasonable chemical shift perturbation, but in this case it is happening at intermediate exchange when the 2 protein is binding, uh, 2 globular proteins are binding, the peak starts di disappearing which is saying intermediate regime binding and which is substantiated by the KD and now intensity is started disappearing. Okay. So, so, the NMR time scale and uh, its relation to binding is, is very crucial to understand that depends upon what is the KD, what is the K on rate, what is the K off rate, what is the ligand concentration. So, sometimes it is possible that affinity can be in nanomolar range, but the process happens in slow exchange, the, it is exchanging between the two peaks like for an example in this case you see here is a free ligand only one peak, but in the in the bound form it is shifting completely towards other other state. But in between you see the other peaks starts appearing and, and one of the peaks start disappearing. So, slowly these peaks disappear and these peaks started building. This is a slow exchange process, but the binding happens in the nanomolar range. Okay. The in another case one can see that here binding happens in fast exchange because you see continuously the peaks are shifting here. The binding happening in fast exchange, but the affinity is in the micromolar range. So, the protein-protein interaction which observed at protein comes in various uh, various forms 
depending upon what is the exchange rate and what is the affinity. So, here fast exchange happening at a micro modular range, in the another case it was slow exchange happening in nano modular range. Okay, so, that is what each protein protein interactions let us summarize what we, we saw it today. Protein ligand interaction happens with a different time scale and different strength, strength in terms of KD and time scale in terms of the uh, exchange rate with respect to NMR time. And one can reliably fit the chemical shift data to find it out the KD. I show you some of the examples of interactions where you can look at the chemical shift perturbation or look at the disappearance of the peak to get the idea where there is basically these protein interacts and you can using this information you can create a complex model. Okay. So, here uh, with this I am going to end now protein protein and protein ligand interactions and in next week we are going to now um, see how this information can be exploited to understand the drug design and drug development using this protein 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 ligand interaction can we come up with a molecule and then grow this molecule like in terms of chemical synthesis to, be, to, to make it a effective or efficient drugs. So, that is it going to be discussed that that is what we are going to discuss in the next week. Thank you very much and looking forward to see you in the next class. Thank you.